Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. We turn now in our Roberts text to page 778 and following James Tate's classic Dream On from 1998. Tate, born in 1943, he will pass in 2015. An American poet, professor of English at the uh, University of Massachusetts, he did win the Pulitzer as well as the National Book Award. Many have argued that his writing style is surrealistic, comic, maybe even absurdist at times. We're going to love the wit of this poem, so um, and, and let's, let's pay attention now to it. We'll read and we'll exegete as we go. Dream on. Some people go their whole lives without ever writing a single poem. Extraordinary people who don't hesitate to cut somebody's heart or skull open. They go to baseball games with the greatest of ease and play a few rounds of golf as if it were nothing. These same people stroll into a church as if that were a natural part of life. Investing money is second nature to them. They contribute to political campaigns and have absolutely no poetry in them and promise none for the future. They sit around the dinner table at night and pretend as though nothing is missing. Their children get caught shoplifting at the mall and no one admits that it's poetry they're missing. The family dog howls all night, lonely and starving for more poetry in his life. Why is it so difficult for them to see that without poetry, their lives are ephemeral? Sure, they have their banquets, their celebrations, croquet, fox hunts, their seashores and sunsets, their cocktails on the balcony, dog races, and all that kissing and hugging. And don't forget the good deeds, the charity work, nursing the baby squirrels all through the night, filling the bird feeders all winter, helping the stranger change her tires. Still, there's that disagreeable exultation from decaying matter, subtle but ever-present. They walk around erect like champions. They're smooth-spoken, urbane, and witty. When alone, rare occasion, they stare into the mirror for hours, bewildered. There was something they meant to say, but didn't. And if we put the statue of the rhinoceros next to the tweezers and walk around the room three times, learn to yodel, shave our heads, call our ancestors back from the dead, poetry-wise, it's still a bust, bankrupt. You haven't scribbled a syllable on it. You're a nowhere man, misfiring the very essence of your life, flustering nothing from nothing and back again. The hereafter may not last all that long. Radiant childhood, sweetheart, secret code of everlasting joy and sorrow, fanciful pen strokes beneath the eyelids. All day, all night meditation. Not of hope, kernel of desire, pure ordinariness of life, seeking through poetry a benediction or a bed to lie down on, to connect, reveal, explore, to imbue meaning on the day's extravagant labor. And yet, it's cruel to expect too much. It's a rare species of bird that refuses to be categorized. Its song is barely audible. It's like a dragonfly in a dream. Here, then there, then here again. Low flying amber wing darting upward and then out of sight. And the dream has a pain in its heart, the wonders of which are manifold, or so the story is told. Now let's point out really quickly for your notes that this is a poem that will draw heavily on ancient literary traditions. We say we're, of course, the stories we tell, the stories we retell. The opening line, of course, is compelling. Some people go their whole lives without ever writing a single poem. And then we'll end with the word story. The story is told somewhere between the poem the poetry that either gets written or not written, and the story that either gets told or not told, we're reminded of our mantra. That is to say, we are the stories that we tell and retell. We are the stories that we accept, and of course, we're also the stories we decide to reject. 
But the question becomes the ancient Socratic question. You'll remember Socrates says in the Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living, and here we are, of course, with that question. To what degree does it mean to examine your life? The speaker in the Tate offering here says, well, it means that you accept that if life is a dream, and of course there's been all kinds of debate about that one, that one should at least be conscious of the ways in which one is dreaming the dream, living the life. Notice we have two different kinds of people in this book. We have those who have never, ever, ever written a poem. That is to say, they never actually lived their life. And then, of course, those who decide they need to wake up. Notice the ironies of the people who have never written a poem. They somehow are dead to all things living. They have absolutely no poetry in the line 11 and 12 says, and they promise none for the future. They live, well, what is it Thoreau says in Walden, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. They live these kind of desperate types of life. Their children get caught shoplifting at the mall. No one admits that it's poetry they're missing. I love that this poem suggests that if you want to cure a lot of the ills of society, the way to do it, is through teaching your children to read and to write poetry. I guess a father could do much worse than reading aloud some lines of Whitman or Milton or Shakespeare to his son or daughter or mother could figure out that maybe some Jane Austen read out loud is going to be all the poetry that a son or daughter might need. Notice the lives are effluent, wasteful. Notice the interesting voice at line 21. Sure, they have their banquets, their celebrations, cocaine, fox hunts. This sounds very much like that end of the uh, of Song of the Open Road of Whitman. Similar kind of thing, right? Kissing and hugging. And then don't forget the good deeds at line 25. In other words, they live full lives. It's just their empty lives. And of course, standing behind this set of lines, obviously, is T.S. Eliot's hollow men. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. We can be both at the same time. We've given a full lecture on hollow men at learnstrong.net. And then there is that rare occasion when they are finally alone, and they stare into the mirror for hours, bewildered, um, uncertain. And, and this poem captures brilliantly the attempt to try to talk, but when we talk, of course, Eliot will say in Hollow Men, our, when we speak, our voices are quiet as wind in dry grass or rats feed over broken glass in our dry cellar here. Notice, it's a matter of where we're going to put some silly statue. In other words, all of, the, all of our lives seem to be frittered away with these silly details, as Thoreau will say in Walden. And, and the most important thing is where we're going to put the, the rhinoceros statue. Right? Poetry-wise, though, the speaker will say at line 40, it's still a bust, bankrupt. And then the poem shifts with the pronoun you. You haven't scribbled a syllable of it. You're a nowhere man misfiring the very essence of your life, flustering nothing from nothing. Now we're quoting, of course, the great line from Shakespeare's Lear, nothing comes from nothing. And back again. And hereafter may not last all that long. In other words, Recognize you're getting older, and in the process of getting older, you are coming to this realization you haven't done much with your life. When will you begin to do something with your life? Of course, maybe we're asking, when will you awaken, right? Socrates will ask it that way in a, in a number of different of the Platonic dialogues, right? Hereafter may not last all that long. Radiant childhood sweetheart secret code of everlasting joy and sorrow, fanciful pen strokes beneath the eyelids, all day, all night meditation, not of hope, kernel of desire, pure ordinariness of life, seeking through poetry a benediction or a bed to lie down on to connect, reveal, explore. This is, of course, how we define learning in 303. This is why so many of my students love this poem so much to imbue meaning on the day's extravagant labor. It is the meaning. T.S. Eliot will say in Dry Salvages, we had the experience but missed the meaning. Well, obviously we're playing the same, the same game here. Notice the repetition of the word it in the lines to follow, right? And yet, it's cruel to expect too much. It's a rare species of bird that refuses 
to be categorized. Its song is barely audible. It's like, and then a brilliant simile, the dragonfly in a dream, and of course here we are with dream on, right? In a dream, here, then there, then here again, low-flying amber wing darting upward and then out of sight. And the dream has a pain in its heart to sleep, perchance the dream there's the rub, is the way Hamlet will say it in, in Act 3, right? In his heart, the wonders of which are manifold, or, and now we're back to line 21 or line 29, with that just kind of throwaway line, or so the story is, is told. In other words, this is what we've been told about what constitutes legitimate living. Of course, standing behind it is the rhetorical question, are you sure that your life means absolutely nothing? more than these frivolities, these trivial kinds of things. There's got to be something more to our existence. What might that be? In a word, poetry. At 2A, obviously, we're talking about the power of poetry. We are the stories. We are the poems that matter to us and that we continue to retell. We're also the poems, of course, that we decide to accept or reject. At 2B, again, we pointed out the wit of this voice and the repetition of the it in lines 54, 55, 7, and 8. Finally, at 3a, what is your favorite poem about poetry? Uh, obviously, we have to mention, as we already mentioned, Whitman's uh, Leaves of Grass, uh, Song of the Open Road comes to mind. We've got to think about the way Dickinson, Emily Dickinson, will play with language in this way. What is it for you? What, what are the texts that come to mind? And finally, at 3b, what has been your relationship to poetry, dare we say it, to life? Can you live, do you think, without poetry? Or is it in fact the case that poetry is of no value anymore because nobody reads it and nobody cares? Of course, Coldridge in his uh, Defense of Poetry argues, as we've said in other lectures, no, no, it's quite the opposite. The poets are the ones that tie everything together and teach us it's time to awaken. Well, I hope that this poem, Dream On, will lead you to more of James Tate, truly amazing poet. Thank you.